The McGinty government's proposed putting students first legislation to impose contracts on teachers is being debated at Queen's Park this week. It's been called both unfair and unconstitutional. Our first guest in this, our seventh season, disagrees. And joining us now, Laurel Broden, Ontario's Minister of Education and the Liberal MPP for Etobicoke Lakeshore. I want to remind everybody that producers Daniel Kitts and Naveen Vaswani are hosting a Twitter chat on this topic right now. So send us your thoughts using the hashtag AgendaTVO, and we'd like to hear from you. Minister, welcome back to TVO. It's Thank nice you very you again. much. Well, let's just in case, uh, you know, people weren't paying too much attention to this over the summertime, remind everybody of what the highlights are in your Putting Students First Act, which was introduced into the legislature last Monday. Here are the bullet points. Zero percent salary increases for all Ontario publicly funded school teachers in 2012-13 and 2013-14. All teachers will take a 1.5 percent pay cut in the form of three unpaid professional development days. Restructuring of the teacher pay grid for long-term sustainable savings, in other words, no backdoor increases by moving up the grid. Ending the current retirement gratuity for payment of unused sick days, that's a billion seven liability for school boards. And restructuring of the short-term sick leave plan that would see teacher sick days decline to 10 from 20. And according to your ministry, the Putting Students First Act will save the province $2 billion and will avert an expenditure of four hundred and seventy three million a reference to the automatic pay increases that would go into effect if this bill didn't pass first question why do this well we began this conversation with our partners in education some months ago because we've known that collective agreements expire on august thirty first with the need to negotiate a new collective agreement one of the things that we certainly saw on the horizon was the reality that within the ministry of education budget we were going to have to make some choices Don Drummond, for example, gave us some advice some months ago that we shouldn't roll out full-day kindergarten and that we should let our class sizes go up. You rejected that advice. We rejected that, and both of those things would have led to teachers being fired because you wouldn't have needed as many teachers if you didn't have full-day kindergarten and your class sizes went up. Our choices were that we would maintain those jobs, 10,000 teaching jobs, 10,000 support worker jobs, that we would put our investments in our classrooms, and what we needed to ask our partners in education for in this uh, collective agreement period was for a pay, re uh, a pay freeze and to see the end to uh, bankable sick days, which you don't get sick, you don't use those days, and then you cash them out at the end. And so we started that negotiation some six months ago. Uh, we reached agreement now with 55,000 teachers, and it's on that agreement, on the basis of that agreement, that the Putting Students First Act is based. The school boards usually hammer out these agreements with their own teachers individually all over the province. Why this time did the province feel a need to step in and do something on a province-wide basis? So this is the same process that we've followed for the last two sets of collective agreements. Since we've formed government uh, under Premier McGuinty, putting a real focus on ensuring that education across the province is consistent, we've had something called a provincial discussion table. And it is that framework agreement that we uh, take the lead for and we negotiate. And that's the same structure that we've taken in this conversation. Past conversations, perhaps easier, there was resource to be put into those conversations. This one really about asking our partners in education to work with us to protect the gains we've made in education, make sure we keep those class sizes small, continue to roll out full day kindergarten, keep our test scores up, our grad rates up, and focus on the continued renewal and building of the education system. You call them your partners all the time, which suggests a mutually respectful relationship, and of course you know they feel that by bringing in back-to-work legislation, you're not respecting them at all. Their position has been, we never said we would go on strike if we didn't have agreements by the beginning of September. So why was it necessary to do this? Well, let me first answer your first question. They are our partners in education. In Ontario, our education system is studied. People come from around the world to see what we're doing here. We're proud of the policies that we've put in place as a government, but it's teachers in our classrooms that deliver on that. We've just seen our test scores go up again in terms of our EQAO test scores. Our students are doing well. Our students uh, are ranked among the best in the world. And, and that is in large measure because of our teachers' hard work in the classrooms and our students' hard work. So they are our partners. No one said this conversation was going to be easy. And in moving that conversation forward, one of the things that we've had to do is make those choices. And so 
We have uh, had a conversation that started in February of this year. We negotiated for more than 300 hours with the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, which was the first group with which we reached this framework agreement, followed by our Francophone, Francophone Ontarian teachers in both the public and the Catholic, followed by our professional support workers, and just last week a, a group of uh, EAs and support workers, uh, about 3,000 workers okay, across I, the province. I get that, but, you, but, but again, no one was threatening to go out. And part of the reason, I presume in the past, governments pass back to work legislation is that somebody threatens to walk off the job. No one was doing that. So the Putting Students First Act is about putting in place agreements. So I think there's a couple of key points. Ontario families expect us to make decisions that put their students first and put their kids first. We wouldn't be doing so if we took $473 million out of our classrooms to see increased teacher pay. We did not budget for that in this year's budget. We have not given that amount to school boards. School boards would have a, a real challenge finding resource to see teacher pay increases and it would negatively affect the classroom. So I think that that is one thing. We also have a circumstance where we continue to have in the schedule in the second week of September a strike votes that are scheduled for the second week of September by the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. I was very pleased last week that the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation delayed their strike votes. Uh, but we need to school, see school not only start, but we need to have a school year that is without interruption. That's important for parents like myself. It's important for all of those who participate in the education system. That's what we need for our kids. We should remind people you have two six-year-olds in the public school system, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You no doubt saw this in your morning newspaper. I don't know if we can get a shot of this here. It's a full-page ad in, I suspect, many of the dailies across this province today. And if I go down halfway, this point here speaks to what you just said. If the government, here's, here's what the allegation is. If the government doesn't legislate contracts, teachers will receive a 5.5% wage increase. The elementary teachers say that's just false, that only 40% of their teachers would receive an increase, so that you are essentially beating a drum that's not making any noise right now. Who's right on this? We've always said it's only those portion of teachers who are moving up through the grid. I think for Ontarians who don't know this area um, inside out, it's important to know that teachers move through a process where they get recognized for their qualifications and experience. On the whole, about 40% of the teachers are continuing to move through the grid. About 60% of the teachers are at the top of the grid. So it is only those that are moving through the grid. That's the agreement that we reached with the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association was to say, you know what, we don't want the burden of uh, the ch fiscal challenges to be borne only by our youngest teachers. We want everyone to share in that burden. That's why we moved away from uh, a grid freeze to a partial grid freeze to the 1.5% pay cut of all teachers so that even those teachers at the high end who would not be moving through the grid would pay for the movement of younger teachers. And I think it was a very uh, demonstrated strong leadership on the part of, of that union to say we need to support our young teachers because we all know young teachers who have been waiting, have worked hard to find that but first also, job. You also and promised a full grid review next time, didn't you, for the Catholic teachers? Through across the entire system, yeah. we do need to review the grid to get that to, to a sustainable position. Absolutely, we do. Okay. Here's the trade-off. On the one hand, you've got the teachers in the class on day one, and parents across Ontario don't have to worry about whether or not, okay, that's all well and good. The other side of the coin is, yeah, but how happy are they going to be to be there given the circumstances? And you're hearing, I know, all sorts of speculation about whether or not they're still going to coach football or help put on plays or do all of those extracurriculars which are such an important part of the educational experience. Admittedly, we're on day one here, but what are you hearing in terms of whether or not you've poisoned the well and therefore they don't want to do these extracurriculars? You know, I know teachers are there for their students and that they know how important the extracurricular activities are to their students and that they put those at a priority. So I have the highest of hope and expectation that our teachers will continue to deliver on that because they know, they live in neighborhoods and communities where some of their neighbors have lost their jobs. They know that many of the students sitting in front of them, perhaps their parents don't have the number of hours that they used to get at work. What we're asking for is for our teachers to do their part to during these challenging fiscal times that 
have been existed around the globe and, and have affected us here in Ontario, that they do their part, that we're preserving their jobs, that we're keeping the class sizes small so that they can deliver top quality education to the students that they teach. And we're simply saying we need to take a pause when it comes to teacher pay increases well, this year. We clear. can't do it. And we know that teachers, those that I met preparing their classrooms last week, are ready, anxious, and I know that today being the first day of school, there was many welcoming and warm teachers there to accept our students. I, I do get all that, but would you agree that an angry teacher is not a good thing if putting students first is what it's all about? We all need to put our students first, and as a government, we need to do uh, what we needed to do to make sure that we kept the dollars in our classrooms that we invested in our kids. You know. I think that for, for, for all of us in this conversation, it's been a difficult conversation. It hasn't been an easy road, and the agreement that we've now reached with 55,000 teachers, many thought we wouldn't reach that, but we worked hard, we persevered, it was tough, and we found a solution and a pathway forward, and that's what we're looking to put in place across the system. When people knew that you were going to be appearing on this program tonight, because of course we publicized it as best we could, we did ask people on Facebook and Twitter if they had any feedback for you. And here's some. This is from Sean O'Connor, who's apparently a young teacher. And Sean says, if legislation is going to treat us like essential workers, why aren't we paid and respected like essential workers? And then in brackets, arbitration with automatic pay increases, generous overtimes like cops and firefighters get. What would you say to Sean? Well, you know, what I would say to Sean is we've negotiated an agreement and it is that agreement that we want to see in place across the province. The process is not a perfect process. The provincial discussion table is not a, a panacea in terms of the structures that we have in place. We're open to a conversation about how we might fix that process into the future. And as a young teacher, I wish him the best of luck for his first day of school and, and hope that, um, you know, from the perspective of a, of a teacher that's able to support our students, that he will have a great year and our students will have a great year. Okay. Having said that, though, you have not pointed to other professions that your government oversees, whether it's police or fire or, or ambulance or any, you know, whatever, public transit drivers, whatever it is, and you've not said, a freeze on your houses. It's only the teachers so far that you've said we're freezing you. Why shouldn't they feel picked upon if they're the only ones that you're targeting so far? But the statement that you've made is not accurate. I mean, I think the Premier was very clear well, he said last we're week that bankable sick days is something that is of the past, not of the future. That in fact, I'm really proud in the education system that we've replaced bankable sick days with better maternity benefits for young teachers, better sick benefits for young teachers. So I think there's a real balance that can be found there in terms of that support. We don't directly, uh, firefighters, transit workers, as you said, those are in within the municipal frame of reference, but I think the Premier has been very clear that that is not in, in the future. As it comes to all of the broader public sector and the public sector, as those agreements come in place, we're having some tough conversations with doctors, we're having tough conversations with other of our partners in the public sector. We all need to do our part to ensure that we can live within our fiscal means and to deliver the top quality public services that Ontarians expect. Teachers have their part to do, so do many others. The Toronto Star is usually a pretty liberal-friendly newspaper, I think it's fair to say. But here's Thomas Welcome from a few days ago writing in the Toronto Star, quote, The Liberals are desperate to win two September 6 by-elections in order to gain a majority of the seats in the provincial legislature. They reckon that taking on the unions will play particularly well in one riding, Kitchener-Waterloo, that has traditionally elected Tories. True? This conversation began many, many months before any by-elections were on the horizon. I first asked our partners, all of our unions, to come in, all of our school boards in December to talk about the real challenges that we had in the Ministry of Education budget, that we needed to take the growth curve from 5% down to 2% this year, down to 1% the next year. Always new dollars coming into the system, but to talk about our desire to use those dollars to roll out full-day kindergarten. We worked through February, March. This is a much longer conversation. And, you know, I would say uh, you're right. I, I mean, in terms of uh, the Toronto Star, I, I think some of your viewers will recall that um, there has been a supportive editorial in both the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail talking about no one wants to be in a circumstance where we needed to put this legislation. But we find ourselves here. We need to do it for the best interests of Ontario students, of their parents, and our education system. And so that's what we've done. Conversely, 
one could look at the last eight years, nine years, I guess, that uh, Premier McGuinty's government's been in power, and you know, the criticism of you guys has always been, from the other side, you've done everything the teachers have wanted. Almost everything they've asked for, they've gotten. That's been the observation. The first time you go to them and you say, we got some tough medicine for you to get through the next couple of years, they turn on you. Are you ticked off at them? I think when we had resource and the province was doing well financially, we were really proud to put dollars into our education system. All of us, I would say, including myself, were elected because we didn't like what was happening in the education system and we decided we wanted to be part of a government that wanted to rebuild public education. We've done that. Are you Test ticked off at them? So are you ticked at them? No, we look to them to say we need them to do our part. Our teachers are working hard in our classrooms every day. That's what we expect of them. We know that they will deliver. Are we saddened by the fact that, for example, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario Union leadership walked away from our conversation after less than an hour? Of course I'm not happy about okay. that. And I asked them many times to come back, and they didn't. Let me do one more thing here. We had an online conversation with someone named Harad Zafari from the Ontario School Trustees Association. Uh, he wondered aloud about what we talked about earlier, whether or not all of this would have some kind of impact in the classroom and, and permeate the classroom experience. Uh, he's asked what question he would like to hear you answer on this program. Have a look at the monitor. Here's what he said. Roll tape, please. Yeah, I'd be curious to know uh, if the minister could go back in time, uh, how she would deal with this process since day one, um, whether you know, she'd take the same path or she'd uh, work more towards collective agreements. If you had to do it all over again, could you answer his question? Sure. I wish we could have garnered more agreements. I, I wish that we didn't get ourselves into this point where we were so many months into the process and we had only secured agreement with 55,000 teachers. I'm proud of that, of the agreements that we've reached, but we didn't reach enough agreements. That got us to a point where on the cusp of September 1st, we needed to provide assurance to Ontario families about the choices we would make in the education system, that we would keep the dollars in the classrooms. The structure, as I talked about, the provincial discussion table structure, did not give me any tools to force people to be at the table if they chose to walk away. That's why, as part of the OACTA agreement, we've put in place a conversation that needs to take place by the time we have this conversation again two years from now, perhaps under a different framework. Because I think everybody agrees that perhaps this uh, framework didn't help us get to where we needed to get to. So uh, we are where we are. We'll take the steps that we need to take to put Ontario students first. That's the steps that we've taken. But would we like to have reached negotiated agreements with all of our teachers? Of course we would have. Laurel Broden, Minister of Education, good of you to visit us at TVO today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.